let's go back and reconsider our system that we had from the day before. Remember we had a system here where we had mercury and uh, it was in a, in a uh, one molar uh, proton solution. How are we doing here? Okay. So in other words, we have a mercury electrode and uh, we're putting that in a, a one molar solution and then we'll have a reference electrode versus that. And we know that, uh, let's suppose it's one molar hydrogen ions and one molar chloride ions. Now if we do a potential voltage curve, again, current is on the y-axis and potential would be on this axis. We could draw and say that over a range of potentials, no reaction would occur. In fact, uh, only until we get quite negative do we get a reaction for the reduction of hydrogen ions to hydrogen gas. But quite quickly as we go to positive potentials, we see a reaction to form Hg2Cl2, which is a calomel type uh, reaction. On the other hand, if we take that same system, and we'll draw it in, in red here, and we have instead of a mercury electrode, we have a platinum electrode in one molar H plus and one molar chloride, we get quite a different looking curve. In fact, as we approach the positive, or zero on this scale, the reaction quickly occurs. In other words, on a platinum electrode, we see a um, reaction hydrogen gas. And on the oxidation side, in fact, what we see is a, not the formation of mercury chloride, but we see the formation of chlorine gas from chlorine. Okay, so this shows you the fact that, in fact, uh, we have different electrodes, we can have different types of chemical reactions occurring. And the difference between these two basically is a kinetic difference. In other words, this reaction occurs very slowly on the mercury electrode, the proton reduction, but occurs quite rapidly on the uh, platinum electrode. In fact, there's about a nine order of magnitude difference in the reaction rate on those two systems. Okay. Now, if we take this system, and we find that it actually turns out we have to be at about minus 1.8 volts to get that reaction to occur. And we call this system kinetically polarized. Remember, we use the term polarized to indicate a system where the electrode has acquired a potential. In this case, we're polarizing the electrode by applying some external potential to it, but it's polarized because it's allowed to be put at that potential without any significant current being flown. In this case, the platinum electrode cannot be kinetically polarized in this system at a very negative potential because the reaction occurs rapidly. On the other hand, we can think of systems that are what we call thermodynamically polarized. And for example, on a platinum electrode, remember we talked about anthracene and acetonitrile. And a platinum electrode with anthracene in it and acetonitrile, we saw that it had a, a reaction current potential curve something like this where we required negative potentials to form the radical anion and we required positive potentials to form the radical cation systems. In other words, we had to apply potentials to do a chemical, electrochemical process. In this case, the potential, the electrode is polarized again, but it's polarized by a thermodynamic considerations. So it would be thermodynamically 
thermodynamically polarized. In other words, the reaction is not limited by kinetics, but it's limited by the fact that until we get sufficiently negative or positive, the reaction is not thermodynamically predicted to occur. And so there's not any energy for it. So this is an important aspect of chemist electrochemistry is to sometimes we'll have systems that are not occurring because there's a kinetic limitation. Sometimes we'll have systems that are not occurring because we have a thermodynamic limitation. The important thing to remember is that even though this reaction, for example, the mercury, uh, the reduction of protons on mercury is a, assumed to occur, um, or thermodynamically could, should occur at a very low negative potentials, in fact, kinetically it's slow. Now remember what we call this current that was flowing out at these points. We call this a Faradaic current. call it Faradaic because it's in honor of the guy Michael Faraday who first showed that the amount of current that's flowing is directly related to the amount of chemical reaction that's occurring. So you would expect that if I took a potential and started say from this potential and stepped out to here or if I stepped the potential from here or any point in between this point where the current actually starts to flow, we should see no current flowing. And in fact, that's true. If we put the potential at any of these points and we wait a long time, we see that no current flows or very tiny amounts of current will flow under those situations. However, there is a dynamic, a dynamic effect that happens. Remember we're asking, let's suppose we take this system up here again. I can't put both of them on the same, but this is this reaction of protons on a mercury electrode. And I do a system where I dynamically step the potential of the mercury electrode from zero to minus one volt. Okay, now again, if I step to minus one volt here, there should be no current flowing. But in fact, we see this sort of situation. If we assume that's time equal to zero, we get a, a curve that looks like this. Initially, we see zero current because we haven't done anything yet, but at the point where we do the step, at time equal to zero, we get a, a very large increase in current and then a, a decrease in the amount of current with time. So what's happening here? In this dynamic experiment, we predict that no Faradaic current will flow. So the current that's flowing must be a non-Faradaic current. In fact, that's what's happening. This is a non-Faradaic If we look at that carefully, we can do a couple things. First of all, we can integrate that current and get the amount of charge that flows during that system. And notice that it, it goes to zero. In fact, it goes in sort of an asymptotic approach to zero. But after you know, a reasonable amount of time, it's effectively equal to zero. So we can integrate over that time frame and get the amount of charge that has passed in that particular case. Also, if we look at that system, we see that the curve looks a lot like an exponential decay. In other words, it uh, has the characteristic of an exponential, mathematically exponential function. And in fact, this looks exactly like the current you'd see at a capacitor. If we take a capacitor, and remember a capacitor is a device that they uh, use in electronics to store charge on metal plates or conducting plates. Um, uh, and if we step the potential on a capacitor, we get these sorts of exponential curves. So our electrode, the mercury electrode in the one molar HCl solution acts like a capacitor when we step the potential. All right. So the current we're seeing here again is not due to a chemical process that's occurring. It's occurring due to some sort of a capacitor type process. Now let's, let's do some electronics here just for a minute. Suppose we have a system, an electronic system composed of a battery and a capacitor, okay, and a switch. 
Here's our switch. Here's our contact on the switch. Here's the battery. That's the symbol for a battery, those alternate short and long lines. That's capacitor. Now the capacitor is initially uncharged, but what happens when we close the switch? Okay, on a capacitor. In fact, what we see is that current will flow so that we get electrons moving in this direction. And we get a charge build up on the plates of our capacitor. And so we get a separation of charge on that capacitor. Now charge does not pass through the capacitor, but we do get an amount of charge flows. And now the charge will flow until uh, the voltage on the capacitor equals the voltage on the on the battery. How much charge flows? Well, the charge would be given the, uh, the abbreviation Q. And for a capacitor, the charge is equal to the capacity times the voltage, or the capacitance, I should say. And that's in coulombs. And then that would be the volts the voltage. So whatever the battery voltage is and whatever the capacitance is would be, would be how much charge would flow in that particular system. And we can either calculate it from the capacitance and the voltage or if we didn't know, for example, what the capacitance was, we could integrate the current that flows from zero to infinity and get the charge of the uh, system that way. And uh, that would give us that particular system. Another thing about capacitance is that we can now characterize the capacitance of a particular type of capacitor as this, where the capacitance is equal to what these what they're called dielectric constants, and this is. Um, This is called the permittivity of free space. Okay, and that would be essentially the, uh, the vacuum dielectric constant in real units. And the dielectric constant uh, here, shown by epsilon, capital epsilon, is a, um, is a normalized quantity. Uh, for vacuum, E is equal to one. is approximately equal to one in air. E is uh, a 77 for distilled water. And E is about six, approximately six for things like glass. Plastics might have a dielectric constant of three or so. So what's that mean? Well, that means that we compare back up to this system, we see that for a particular type of capacitor, and this is, would be a fact a parallel plate capacitor, the dielectric, the amount of capacitance that we have depends on the dielectric constant and this term here, which is the distance between the plates. So having a higher dielectric constant means that we're going to have a higher um, capacitance, all things being equal, keeping the same distance. So if we compare a capacitor made with vacuum between the plates to a capacitor made with distilled water between the plates, the capacitance would be about 77 times larger. So since our electrochemical cell is made out of water mostly, uh, we, should, we expect actually a large capacitor effect because of that. Now let's take our system again and put our mercury electrode in contact with, let's, let's change it a little bit, let's make it some sodium ions and chloride ions in solution. 
and we'll put on the other electrode just as something to, to be in the other system. Let's make it platinum. If we apply a potential across this system, this sodium chloride system, for the mercury and platinum. In fact, there will be a range of potentials where no Faradaic current can flow, but we'll get this capacitive type process occurring. Now, how does that work out? Well, because our mercury electrode has got a negative potential to it, there are going to be a buildup of charge on that mercury electrode. Why is there a buildup of charge? Because there is no Faradaic reaction that can remove that charge from it. Whenever we have this electrode polarized, we have some charge on that system. Likewise, the platinum electrode will have a buildup of positive charge as well on the platinum electrodes. Now the solution, because those ions are in solution, they're mobile, they can actually become attracted to that negative charge. And so we can take our sodium ions and have them be attracted to that electrode. And we can have the chloride ions being attracted to that electrode. They're attracted, they're, they're being close to that electrode, but they're not having a reaction. They're not having a Faradaic reaction because there is no, not enough energy, for example, to take an electron from the mercury metal and put it onto that sodium uh, ion. That requires more energy than is available in this particular system. But those sodium ions and chloride ions are not completely separate. In fact, there's chloride ions around. They're just not as close to the electrode as they, um, as they are, uh, as the other ones are. So what's happening here? Now we see the, the agreement between our physical system, the electrode in a solution, and the capacitor. In the capacitor, we had parallel plates of metal. Here we have a plate of metal and a, pl uh, a region of solution. But the, diff the, the dis distinguishing features are very similar. We have a buildup of charge on one side of that metal and a buildup of charge on the solution phase. And so this separated charge region is just like a capacitor. So as we apply different potentials to the system, we expect capacitive behavior out of our electrode in solution, and that's exactly what we do see. Because these ions are very small, the distance is quite tiny. And so not only do we have a, a large dielectric for water, the electric constant for water, we have a very tiny distance. So that means that the capacitance of our electrode is not inconsiderable. It's actually quite large. And uh, a fact that's been used actually to make capacitors uh, that you use for electronic devices as well. So it's not something we can ignore. In fact, we always have to worry about this, what they call double layer charging in the system. All right, so let's, let's do an experiment on our head. Let's take a system like this where we have a, a cell, electrochemical cell that's separated again by a porous plug. And on one side of that cell we have a solution that's containing a platinum electrode. Here's our platinum electrode. It's encased in glass at every point except for the end, so maybe it's a little disc-shaped electrode. And what about the other one? Let's make it a, uh, a pool of mercury and in a sodium chloride solution. So essentially it's like a saturated calomel electrode, and we'll make a little connector there for that as well. So we have mercury metal in solution with, uh, in a chloride solution, and then we have our platinum electrode, and also let's suppose it's in a sodium chloride solution with a little porous frit. So here what we'd have, we'd have mercury, so it would be that's why well, I said sodium, not potassium. So let's make it sodium. We'll have our porous frit. And then on the other side of that system, basically we have, the only thing that's really important is that we have this mercury chloride called calomel and mercury in solution. 
And remember, we're, we're going to use this kind of as a reference electrode. So this is the SCE reference electrode, or the saturated calomel electrode. We haven't talked about that too much, but we'll talk about it later. So just keep that in mind. Now, since these system is set up, we don't really have any opportunity for Faradaic reactions to occur. We, we know that the sodium ion is not going to react with the platinum electrode electrochemically, except at very high potentials, and we're going to ignore those. Uh, and so we have now, instead of a chemical system or an electrochemical system to worry about, we have a uh, basically a purely electrical system to think about. And in fact, what we can do is we can make a model electrical circuit out of our cell. And we can draw a capacitor, a resistor, and we'll call that resistor R sub solution, and we'll call this capacitor C sub HG. Oh. I said that was uh, I said that was platinum, didn't I? But let's let's just have it. That's just mercury. So sorry about that. And then we have another capacitor. We'll call that C S C E. And again, we'll have a circuit with a ammeter or a current meter in the system, a switch, and a potential source. And. We'll call this, we'll have a variable potential source. So we'll use a little arrow there to indicate that. So here's our electrical circuit. Now if we close that switch, what's going to happen? Well, those capacitors are going to start charging um, up, just like we predict as before. The resistance of the solution, though, will limit the rate of that reaction, because it's the, the larger the resistance, the slower the current can actually flow through that system to uh, balance the charges out. Well, it turns out also that if we um, make some simplifying assumptions, let's suppose we, the resistance of the solution is very small, then essentially we have a system like this where we have two capacitors in parallel. And if you remember from physics, if we calculate what the effect of two capacitors in parallel is, the total capacitance is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And C total is then equal to C1, C2 over C1 plus C2. And so our, my point is, is that if C1 is much, much greater than C2, Ct is approximately equal to C1. Because what will happen if, if um, C1 is much, much less, then this effectively becomes zero and that cancels out. And so CT is approximately equal to C sub 1. So it's kind of a uh, non-intuitive effect, but in fact that's the way it works out. The largest capacitance in the system becomes minimal. We don't have to worry about it. And the effective capacitance of the system is, is uh, driven by the smallest capacity. Now usually the way we have our system set up, we have our electrode of interest, which maybe is this one over here, much smaller than our uh, reference electrode. The reference electrode is designed to have a large surface area and so on. So it has usually the largest capacitance. So usually we can rewrite our cell without too much worries of being incorrect as like this and ignore entirely the effect of the reference electrode in the system. I screwed that up, but there's a battery, and so on. Okay. So again, at that point, our relationship between the model electrical circuit and the reality is again we have a mercury electrode with a buildup of negative charge on the one side and perhaps a positive charge on the other side. So these are ions absorbed at the electrode surface, either absorbed or very close to the electrode surface. So you have this nice capacitive process. Now capacitance of this electrode is called the double layer capacitance. Why 
Why is it called that? Well, you can see there's a double layer. There's a layer of charge on one side of the electrode and there's another layer of charge on the other side of the electrode. So this charge is a double layer. And so ele electrochemists are always talking about the double layer capacitance of their electrode. And so we abbreviate that by C sub D. And that is typically um, equal to uh, 10 to 40 microfarads per square centimeter. So it depends, obviously it depends on the size of the electrode. If larger the electrode, the more area we've got, the more capacitance that we're going to have. So this in fact is a, what they call a specific capacitance because we've uh, used the area in the term. two things to think about here. Now we've got a charge on the electrode surface that we can vary by varying the potential of the electrode. Even if we don't allow any chemical reaction or Faradayic reaction to occur, we can move ions around from the solution uh, to be attracted or repelled by the metal electrode because we can change the potential of the metal. And so actually we use a specific term for that. The potential of the metal is phi sub m. When we talk about metal, that's usually metal electrode. Now, in fact, we could have carbon electrodes, which aren't metals, but uh, so usually we'll use phi sub m, even so. And phi sub s is the potential of the solution. Now, the potential difference between the metal and the solution. Um, has to be zero in this particular case because we have to have electroneutrality for the system. We're putting in so many electrons from our power supply, but that electron charge, for example, in the metal has to be balanced out by an equal uh, potential on the solution. So because of the electrostatics, we have to have uh, the metal potential equal to the solution potential at that electrode surface. Now we don't necessarily have to have a, a potential on the metal. Whenever we have a buildup of charge on the electrode surface like that, we're going to have a potential in the system because that's really what a potential is. It's a, an excess amount of charge in the system. But uh, we can actually have systems where the phi sub m is equal to zero. And in that case, they call that point the potential of zero charge, and we'll come across this uh, later, but we'll refer to it now as the potential of zero charge or the PZC. Now this is not the same, PZC is not the same as having an applied potential of zero because just because we have an applied potential of zero does not mean that we don't have an excess amount of charge on the electrode surface. We can have a, an excess amount of electrode charge depending on whether we have, depending on the system properties or the solution properties and so on. We remember that potential of zero is an arbitrary construct that we've assigned to it. It doesn't actually have to do with the real potential of the, of the interface. So it's possible to have uh, charge on the metal surface even if we have an applied potential of zero to it. All right. So now let's take a look again at our electrode model. So we can make it very simple now. We have C sub D and R sub S or R sub solution. And you might remember this if you took physics in college, and you probably all have. Uh, you can actually derive the, uh, the um, electrical properties of this capacitance solution, or capacitor resistor um, circuit. Uh, so if we take this circuit and we do a step of the potential from time equal to zero from, say, some initial potential to some final potential, 
E0, EF, we would observe a current with time behavior very similar to this. And that, again, is an exponential function. Now, you can derive that. You might go back and look at that derivation. But you'd see in that case that the current that flows is equal to um, E sub F over R sub S times the exponential function of minus T over R S C D. And if we take the natural log of that current versus time, we see that there is a straight line behavior. Uh, and uh, we can see that the natural log of i is going to be the natural log of E sub f over Rs minus T over Rs Cd. So the slope of that would be minus 1 over Rs Cd. And the y-intercept would be natural log of um, E sub i over Rs Cd. So why am I why am I talking about this? Well, because we because this is like I said is a very important aspect of the electrochemical system. By understanding our simple model cells, we can actually get more information about our actual electrode behavior. For example, by knowing the capacitance of an electrode, often gives us information about the actual area of our electrode. And by looking at the charging, discharging curves of the electrode solution capacitance, we can get information about the solution resistance of something that we may not know directly. Okay. So whenever we do a step like that, we expect this exponential charging current to flow. Now another common type of uh, electrochemical experiment is instead of a step, we do a potential sweep, where we take versus time and potential. We apply, for example, some initial potential and then sweep at a constant linear rate with time, and then perhaps we sweep back with time. So T getting larger. What would be the current that would flow under these conditions? Again, we're assuming no Faradayic reaction, no chemical reaction, just the charging and discharging of our double air capacitance. Well, that's a little bit diff more difficult to uh, derive. In fact, you can do it. Uh, because we've got that initial step there, we actually get kind of a two behaviors. We get a behavior like this, where we do a step, and we also get a behavior um, that's related to the sweep. And it turns out that we get, um, first of all, a term that's VCD. space there, but that's P over Rs C, C sub D. So you get an exponential term here as well. And so essentially what you would see for the current would be something like this, where the current versus time. You would see an initial uh, kind of a uh, this step type curve, and then it would level off with at long time to be equal to VCD. V is actually the slope of the system. So V is equal to the sweep rate. And for example, that might be in terms of volts per second. So it's essentially the slope of that particular um, curve. The important thing to note is that with a constant sweep rate, a linear sweep of the potential, we get a constant 
uh, charging current. In other words, we get a kind of this flat charging current that doesn't vary with time after we do this initial uh, mm -hmm. process. Now, in fact, I've drawn that a little bit incorrectly. Let me draw this again because what happens when we change the slope of our sweep? And let's change it so that instead of starting out at a, some initial potential, we'll start at zero. That makes it a little bit easier. So here's our E. What happens to our T? Well, right at this potential, notice that the slope of our potential change has shifted to be negative. So again, T. So our current would start out and it would look have a constant value of V. Can you Sorry about that. V, C, D. And then as we change the potential slope, there are the sweep slope, we get a negative V sub. Oops. Uh, signal. So here again is our current versus time. Perhaps I should have used a different color pen. Yeah, to, to indicate that particular case. Now, as I said, this is a very common uh, experiment. And in fact, when we apply potentials like this, they call this cyclic voltammetry or uh, variations of that term. And it turns out that uh, an interesting way to plot that is to not plot the current versus time, but to plot the current versus the applied potential. And when we do that, we get a curve that looks like this, where this is current here, but we're applying a potential, so we get a current, sorry about that, current potential curve. And uh, depending on the applied potential, we would get a curves that look like that. So you see the current folds over because of the way we've, we've uh, started out. We've got this initial positive slope and then a negative slope. So we're going the potential out and then back. And we've plotted our signal this way. And if we double the slope, if we sweep twice as fast, the current would be twice as large the effect of that. Again, as we go to shorter time scales, the charging current becomes larger, and the shorter time scales implies faster sweep rates, and the charging current becomes larger as well. Okay. Well, we'll see, in fact, the discussion paper shows you very graphically this effect as we as we go on. And you